In the latter part of 2014, the leader of the opposition, David Granger, moved to the court to challenge government spending and the restoration of funds cut from the 2014 national budget. On Friday last, Chief Justice Ian Trang ruled on this issue. With me to discuss the purport and the nature of that ruling is the Attorney General and Minister of Legal, Affair, Legal Affairs, Anil Nandlal. Thank you for offering me this opportunity, uh, AG, to discuss this issue. It's a pleasure. And I am, of course, your host, Michael Gordon. Let's first uh, discuss, AG, the, let's first, let me first ask the question, what really was before the court? Thank you very much, uh, Michael, and uh, good evening to your viewers. Um, on the 11th day of December, 2014, Mr. David Granger filed a writ of summons, a 10-day writ of summons it is called, or a generally endorsed writ of summons, in the High Court, in which he challenged the legality of the government's actions to restore sums of money which were not approved by the Parliament in the 2014 budget and questioned the legality of that restoration of those monies and the subsequent expenditure of those monies. That is what the writ of summons claimed, reliefs in relation to that. Simultaneous with the filing of that writ of summons was also the filing of an ex parte application by way of affidavit for a conservatory order in which the applicant, Mr. David Granger, prayed for a conservatory order restraining the Minister of Finance and every other minister of the government from spending monies that he described as unauthorized monies. That application for a conservatory order was what is called an interlocutory application. And therefore, that must be heard first. So what, in essence, was before the court was simply an application for a conservatory order, which conservatory order seeks to restrain the government through the Minister of Finance and the various other ministers from spending what the conservatory order described as unauthorized monies. Now, since the application was filed in this, on December the 11th, 2014. The application, it was agreed in the court during the month of December. I don't know the exact date. I can't recall the exact date. That the application will, will be treated as inter partes. What that means is that it will be not heard ex parte, it will not be heard in the absence of any party, but it will be heard together with all the parties present. And when that agreement was arrived at, the Chief Justice then gave directions for all the parties to file whatever affidavits they may wish to file to put to the court their respective contentions. I maintain again, all that we were engaged in was a process to determine whether that conservatory order would be granted or would not be granted. When we completed the process of filing affidavits from all sides, we already reached into January 2015. Arguments begun in January 2015. Because of the lapse of time, therefore, you could not, the conservatory order, which, which was, was the only, originally. 
which was the only application which the court was engaged in determining could not relate to 2014 anymore and therefore could only have related to 2015, 2014 having already been expired. So the question before that court, therefore, was should a conservatory order be granted restraining the Minister of Finance and the other ministers of government from spending monies for the year 2015 in an unauthorized manner? That was the only issue that was before the court. Now, I contended that the order, the conservatory order, should be refused. That was my contention, and that was the contention of learned senior counsel, Mr. Ashton Chase, who appeared for the Minister of Finance. I advanced the following reasons in support of my contention that the order should be refused. One, firstly, that expenditures of government for any given financial year in which there has been no appropriation act or no budget, the constitution and the provisions of the Fiscal Management and Accountability Act together create a formula for how monies are to be spent during that period of the year. Meaning 2015. Meaning 2015, because it is a year in which there has been no Appropriation Act as yet. And it's the Meaning only year on the consideration. No, no budget as yet, okay. right? So it is that period. You're dealing with a period where there is no budget. What do you do? Well, the Constitution and the fi Fiscal Management and Accountability Act lays out a formula how monies are to be spent during this period. And the formula simply is that the Minister of Finance has a right that is described as drawing rights on the consult fund to withdraw monies from the consult fund, consolidated fund, to the tune of one twelfth of what was approved in the previous year budget. It is as simple as that. The, and my contention is, my contention was to the court, that that formula is a formula which the government is aware of. We intend to apply that formula in its letter and spirit we have always done so, 22 years in government, and we intend to do so this year. Therefore, the court has no power, the court has no jurisdiction to interfere with the government's executing that constitutional and statutory formula. Were the court to interfere in that formula or the government spending on the, that formula, then the judiciary would be trespassing in the province of the executive, thereby violating the doctrine of the separation of powers. And I therefore ask the question, what was really the ruling in relation to the application? All right, before in your, in, because you've seen, the follow, if you read the papers the following mm -hmm. day, you, see, you saw different interpretations. You saw different publications, different interpretations. Let, let, me, let me go on to make this point. My second argument why that conservatory order ought not to be granted was that the, the, the State Liability and Proceedings Act of 1980 prohibits the court from granting any order that is either prohibitory or mandatory against the state or any state agency. All right? And a conservatory order is in effect an injunction. It is in effect a prohibitory order. 
You can call it what you wish. You can attempt to mask it by whatever linguistic device you may wish to employ, by describing it as a conservatory order or by some other label. It remains in effect a prohibition against the state or some agent or agency of the state. And the provisions of the State Liabilities and Proceedings Act clearly says that those types of orders cannot be granted against the state. And that, and I said to the court that this conservatory order is essentially an injunction against the state. And therefore, the provisions of that piece of legislation prevents, pre prevent the court from granting that order. That was my second submission. Both of those submissions were upheld by the Honorable Chief Justice. And he refused the application for the conservatory order. He rejected the application of Mr. Granger for that conservatory order. And he said that it was misconceived and he dismissed it. That should have brought an end to the proceedings because that was the only application that was before the court. That was all that we submitted on. The question as to whether the budget was lawfully or unlawfully cut, the question whether Dr. Ashni Singh acted properly or improperly in restoring to, well, rather to spend that which was not approved by the National Assembly were not matters that were before the court. Because they of the expiration of 2014. They were unrelated to the application for the conservatory order. Notwithstanding their irrelevance to the application for the conservatory order, the Honorable Chief Justice went on to make pronouncements on them. And that is why, why I respectfully contend that whatever statements were made in relation to those matters are what can be described in law as obita dicta, meaning that they were remarks that were made on the side, by the way, and they do not form part of the ruling of the, ruling of the decision and, does, and do not form part of the reasons for the decision, and that decision is, and that decision remains, that the application made by Mr. Granger for a conservatory order was rejected by the court. This seems not to have been made pollucidly clear as against what is reported in some sections of Well, the I realized quickly that various media houses created a most distorted view of what was the ruling by highlighting different portions of the ruling. Or the statement, according to you, by the learned uh, Chief Justice. Yes, highlighted different uh, um, portions of the written uh, ruling of the Chief Justice, and I suppose they highlighted those uh, portions which uh, would have suited their particular agenda. And when I saw the gravity and magnitude of the distortion which was taking place, I decided to write. And I wrote a six-page press release, which I disseminated. Yeah, but in fairness to media houses, if I might, uh, and one might argue is that... Uh, Statements made amidst a ruling could, uh, may have been misconstrued as part and parcel of that ruling. Well, I know. I know because um, it takes some degree of uh, legal training to be able to decipher 
from a judgment or to dissect a judgment in order to extract from it the decision itself and remarks which may be made by a judge in the course of his judgment. For example, if I am to appeal, the only thing that is appealable is the decision of the court. And the decision of the court is that the application for the conservatory order was refused. So I can't appeal that. I won. The Chief Justice upheld my submissions when he dismissed the application made by Mr. Granger. But unfortunately, there were statements which he made in the course of his ruling. And those statements were extracted, magnified, and I would dare say manipulated by certain members of the uh, media and aided and abetted by lawyers who appeared for Mr. Granger because somehow or the other day they are claiming victory. And I see people talking about prosecuting and so on. So they aided and abetted the distorting and distortionist, uh, um, the distorting process which emerged. All right, is this consistent, uh, if I might ask, with previous rulings by the Chief Justice? Well, um, to answer your question, I have to dissect the ruling of the Chief Justice and remove from the ruling the decision. The decision is consistent with everything that the Chief Justice has said in previous rulings in relation to this matter, to the, these issues. So there, there is consistency. Where I believe there is some degree of inconsistency and one may say departure from previous pronouncements of the Honorable Chief Justice relate to the statements which were made during the course of the ruling. For example, the Chief Justice decided to examine Article 217 and 218 of the Constitution. Article 217 and 218 of the Constitution have nothing to do with whether a conservatory order should be granted in relation to spending for a year in which there is no appropriation has nothing to do with that, nothing at all. But the Honorable Chief Justice decided to examine those two articles. And it is not the first time that he has examined them. He examined them in the first budget cut case which I filed, and he gave a ruling in July 2012, which we describe loosely as the preliminary ruling. Then the opposition wanted a final ruling, and he gave a final ruling, I believe, in January 2013, some seven, eight months after. So there are two rulings on this matter, and the two rulings are almost identical on the issue of 217 and 218 of the Constitution. They are identical. What he said then in the previous rulings, previous rulings, I had asked him in those cases, in that budget court case, one of the reliefs, first of all, I asked in the case itself, I was the applicant or plaintiff, and one of the reliefs which I sought from the court was a declaration that the reduction of the estimates of the Minister of Finance by the opposition were unlawful, unconstitutional, null, void, and of no effect. Therefore, the budget cuts were basically unlawful. That was the first relief I asked for. The second relief I asked for was an order permitting the Minister of Finance to restore those parts of the budget that were unlawfully cut. The Chief Justice granted me the first declaration 
a declaration that the budget cuts were unlawful, unconstitutional, ultra virus, null, void, and of no effect. Granted that. In relation to the second order, that is the order permitting the Minister of Finance to restore the budget cuts, the Chief Justice said, I am not going to grant that. The Minister of Finance has the power to do so. Were I to grant that, then I would have been standing, I would be standing in the shoes of the Minister. That the Constitution and the Financial, the Fiscal Management and Accountability Act, these two sources of power, two sources of law, reside in the minister, the power, and the very section that he used, the very article that he used, was 218.3 of the Constitution, equipping the minister with that power. So he declined to make the order. And he said he would be usurping the function of the minister were he to grant that order that the minister under the constitution must make a finding whether these they, they are, are sufficiency. And if I may quote the, the exact section of the constitution, Article 218. Article 218 says this. If in respect of any financial year, it is found that the amount appropriated by the Appropriation Act for any purpose is insufficient or that a need has arisen for a purpose for which no amount has been appropriated by this Act or that any monies have been expended for any purpose in excess of the amount appropriated for that purpose by the Act or for which no money has been appropriated by the Act the Minister of Finance shall, once he finds these things, he shall either by way of a supplementary estimate go to the Parliament and get approval or if he has spent the money having found that there is a need for the monies to be spent because of some insufficient budgetary allocation or where there is no budgetary allocation, then he can make that finding and use a statement of excess and go to the consult fund and spend the money and use a statement of accessory and go back to the parliament and say, look, this is what I have spent, it's a this, is the this is the purpose for which I spent it, and I've utilized 218.3 of the constitution in so doing. The Chief Justice said in his first two rulings that the minister, by utilizing this power, in, his, in the minister's hands lies the remedy, and therefore the court will not grant me the remedy. And that is the provi that those, those provisions of the Constitution, along with the guidance provided by the Chief Justice, in his two rulings, not one, two rulings that were used and the monies were spent. Significantly, as I said, the first ruling occurred in July of 2012 and the second ruling occurred in January of 2013. In that interregnum of eight months, the Minister of Finance had actually restored monies which were cut from the budget of 2012. Remember the 2012 budget, we had restored the budget cuts utilizing the same mechanism of 218.3 of the Constitution. While we were arguing the case, these things were done between the first and the second ruling. And the very lawyers who appeared for Mr. Granger in this matter were the same lawyers, essentially, who were appearing in the budget court case. And they drew these matters to the Chief Justice's attention. And we had arguments then about them. So at that, in that case, they were relevant. The same argument that, that, that the same type of our, um, issues, it actually arose in a relevant fashion before the Chief Justice. And all the parties, through their legal representatives, presented arguments 
and it is the Chief Justice who maintained in his final ruling, having heard those arguments, that the power resides with the minister to go and use the monies by virtue of utilizing the provision of Article 2183 and lay statements of excess in the National Assembly to account for what purpose these monies were spent. Okay, A.G., we are practically out of time, but I want to ask you to speak a bit about the binding aspects of the ruling. Well, the binding aspects of the ruling, it's only the decision of a case that is binding. And the decision, the only, only one decision has been made, and the decision that has been made is that the application for the conservatory order was dismissed. Meaning? Meaning that the application that Mr. Granger made to the court was refused. But what is significant though, um, Michael, is also what we should talk about, um, and I'm sorry that we are running out of time, is what were these monies used for by the government? You know, every time I, I look, I see government uh, unlawfully spent $4.5 billion. The impression which is conveyed is that the government used this money by, uh, by you know, by, by, by uh, used it for itself or for some personal reasons. I mean, at some point in time, we will have to sit down and go through the projects. Let, let's, let's list some of the Let projects. Let me list some of the projects. The student loan at the university, you know, all the student loans were cut out of the budget. We put back that money and the students now have loans to go to the university. The $10,000 education grant that was given to a child in every public school throughout the length and breadth of this country, that was cut out of the budget. We put that back in. Hundreds of employees in the state sector, from Office of the President to the Ministry of Finance to the Ministry of Housing, GINA, NCN, they were all cut. None of these people could have been paid. None of these employees could have been paid. We took the money and we put it back in the budget so that the employees can be paid. $3.2 billion was cut. Subsidies to GPL. If that subsidy was not given to GPL, then light bill would have increased. We put that money back so that the people of this country did not have to pay an increased light bill. Another four billion or so dollars was put into the sugar industry as subsidy again. Were we not, did we not put that money in, then the sugar workers, 18,000 sugar workers would not have been paid. The hinterland airstrips were all cut out of the budget. We put that money back and we repaired the hinterland airstrips. The Amerindian development projects were cut out of the budget. We put that back in and the Amerindian in the hinterland of our country, they have their, their, their developmental projects being financed. These are only some of the budget cuts which were restored. And that is what the $4.5 billion dollars it was spent for the people of this country, the very people that the opposition want to go to and ask them to vote for them. But these are the very people whose livelihood, in essence, were cut out of that budget. And this government restored those monies so that the public servants could have been paid, so that people would not have had to pay, the country could, would not have had to pay more light bill, the sugar workers, 18,000 of them, would be paid, the Amerindian people would, would have gotten their developmental money, the hinterland airstrips could have been fixed, the airport project can go ahead, and so many other, the Hope Canal project can go ahead. All these things were cut, and they were restored. The uniform program for the school, the school feeding program, all of those programs come under an umbrella of poverty of alleviation programs financed out of the Ministry of Finance. That entire agency was cut 
today when the children of our country are being fed in the schools and they are being given uniforms, that is only possible because we restore that money. So those who wish to create the impression that there was some big illegality committed, they must understand that the beneficiary of that money was the people of this country. Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs, Anil Nandilal, I think we, we spoke to some length and in great detail on the issue of the Chief Justice's ruling in relation to the restoration of funds cut from the national budget by the opposition and the application made by the leader of the opposition, David Grinch, to the court uh, in relation to the restoration of those monies. I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to have these discussions. And I, I do hope sometime in the near future that we could continue to engage in discussions such as these. Thank you I'm very your, much. It has been a pleasure to be here. I'm your host, Michael Gordon. Thanks for being a part of this program.